What's up, everybody? We have a new friend to talk about, Chandon Sullivan. We got to talk about where that leaves the roster, if he's even good. And hey, let's do a mock draft while we're at it here on the Locked On Vikings podcast. <laughs> You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, your pal, and the kid you copied off in math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. You can find the show on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. And today on the show, we're talking about Chandon Sullivan. The Vikings signed a new player in Chandon Sullivan out of Green Bay. Another Mike Pettin guy, I guess. Not necessarily a Mike Smith guy. He's the outside linebackers coach. Chandon Sullivan is a slot corner. He's a nickel corner. Um, And he is, uh, I'm going to go with okay. And we're going to call that a generous. We'll do that. He is a slot corner. Um, But it is yet another free agent in this kind of trend that we've seen of players coming to play for their former position coaches here in Minnesota. You have Chandon Sullivan playing for Mike Pettin. Um, You have Austin Schlotman coming in from Denver, Johnny Munt, of course, Zedaria Smith, although that's a much more justifiable one. Um, But it seems like these role players, they're, they're really prioritizing familiarity. And that's a really interesting free agency strategy. And I'm not sure if I agree with it. It seems to narrow down the free agent pool a little bit. Um, and that's never a good thing. You know, you can't daydream about a JC Treader or a Stefan Gilmore, right? You also need to have a connection with some coach from somewhere and you have to go sleuth all that out. Why don't you just sign good players? But uh, maybe that's just how it happens to be working out, right? Benefit of the doubt and all. Maybe that's just how it's all working out, right? Benefit of the doubt and all. Um, so let's talk about Chandon Sullivan himself. So he is small, uh, 5'11". I'm going to go with under 200 pounds, although he's been listed over 200, I think, sometimes. I kind of don't buy it. Um, so small. And that makes you a nickel corner. And he's a nickel corner. Um, if you ask Green Bay fans, they probably will laugh that the Vikings signed him. They seemed to not be very big Chandon Sullivan fans. And I remember going over Chandon Sullivan as a weak point, as a marked man when I was previewing a Packers game with Peter Bukowski on a crossover Thursday during the season. And he was like, yeah, Shannon Sullivan's the guy you go after. And the Vikings went after him in the run a little bit in that game. I believe it was the 2020 Lambeau game, the improbable upset when the Vikings were like one and six and they uh, beat the one and five and they beat the Packers that week. But I digress. That's all anecdotal, right? Um, I, I do say like in run support, in run defense, he's just small. That's it. His tackling form is is very messed up, and it's because he's compensating for being small. Um, There's not a lot of, like, beef, so he can't just go hit you. He can't hit you around the waist and take your momentum that way. He kind of has to dive. He has to be really good at wrapping with his arms, and he just doesn't quite have that exactly perfect technique that you need to have sometimes. There's just a lot of diving, and the angles are weird sometimes. And it's like, unless everything is absolutely perfect, it's going to be hard for him to bring in that tackle that leads to a lot of missed tackles, and there's not much he can do about that. And this is something a lot of nickel corners like suffer from. Um, but you know, you'll hear during draft season, you'll, you'll hear a lot of smaller guys that play bigger than they are. I say that about Stefan Diggs all the time. He plays way bigger than he is. Shannon Sullivan does not play bigger than he is. He plays exactly the size that he is, and it's a small size. Um, but we don't care about run defense, right? That much, I mean, I, I do, but I know none of you care about run defense. You heathens. You're here for the the pass defense, the coverage. What about the interceptions? He got three picks last year. Um, Those were all very opportunistic picks. Got decent ball skills, I think. Um, But here's what I see in coverage. I see limited technique. um, And by limited, I mean like he doesn't have an arsenal of certain footworks and hip turns and stuff like that. Um, I think it was Nick Olson who pointed out on uh, Twitter, he was doing some work on Shannon Sullivan, that he just doesn't backpedal very often. And that's a really interesting thing from the slot. So he's always doing a hip turn or a bail technique. um, And there's not a lot of jamming, not a lot of press. Uh, Again, I've said this before. I talked about Trent McDuffie, who seems just like a more athletic version of Shannon Sullivan. They've got a lot of the same traits, but Trent McDuffie's athletic. Um, and, uh, Chandon Sullivan just doesn't have the athleticism. It's why he didn't get drafted. He was an undrafted free agent, but it's a lot of the same stuff. He doesn't press. He doesn't have the size. He's not a physical corner. He's not menacing or imposing. He kind of is just a dude you plug in that can do like an okay job. I don't think he's a bad corner. 
Like, he certainly belongs in the NFL, and the Vikings have trotted out people who don't in the last two years. So we're. I think I, my criteria was vaguely alive because we just need so many bodies in the, the corner room. And Chandon Sullivan, vaguely alive. Checks the box. So sure, come on down. And it's a one-year deal. Can't imagine a very expensive one, so whatever. But he does seem like he's a lot more comfortable in a drop back zone, watch the quarterback's eyes, break on the ball, play aggressive kind of role. That seems like where he's at his best, not manning up a tight end or manning up a slot receiver or, you know, going step for step with someone that the lack of speed shows up, the lack of size shows up, the lack of range shows up, the lack of wingspan shows up, all of those athletic deficiencies that we usually just sort of auto downgrade a god a guy for, um, makes sense to downgrade him for. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes, oh, you know, he doesn't have the size, but he's got a good contested catch. No, this, you're downgrading him for the size. And he hasn't been able to overcome that to become like a true plus starter in the league. But he is a guy. And here's the deal. I don't think I'm satisfied with him as the nickel corner. I would love to see somebody else come in and win that job. I would love to see Harrison Hand come in and play the flashes he showed his rookie year and just like turn into that guy. And then he beats out Shannon Sullivan. That would be sick. That would be the awesomest thing. And that's kind of what I think has to happen to improve upon Shannon Sullivan. I'm going to guess he's the starting nickel corner. And I'm just like not that into it. Um, one final thing. A lot of people say, well, at least he's not Mackenzie Alexander. I want to posit that Mackenzie Alexander is better than Shannon Sullivan. Uh, maybe that sounds like just like sour grapes because I don't know. I was a bigger fan. I was kind of a defender of his. Um, but in Zimmer's scheme, nickel corner was a lot harder than it will be in the Donatel Fangio scheme. Uh, nickel corner in Zimmer's scheme. You can go back and, and read and listen to some of the like coverage explainers I did before Zimmer was fired. Um, but basically you had to be a liaison and you had to be making a lot of calls, a lot of like, you had to be basically calling plays in the middle of the play. That is a job of the nickel corner in a Saban, a Belichick, uh, a Zimmer, a whoever. There's a lot of NFL teams running this. It wasn't just Zimmer, but in that scheme, the nickel is making play calls often, um, and making adjustments and stuff on the fly. You kind of have to understand everything. And it's so different from what you do in college. It's why players like Mackenzie Alexander took two years to get better, um, and I do think that he did a pretty good job with that particular assignment. He did mess up some pass offs and he had a lot of problems. He, he wasn't a guy, like I wasn't sitting here pounding the table for them to sign him to another one year deal or anything. But I don't think Shannon Sullivan would be better. I think his job will be easier. Uh, and maybe you'll get better production because of that, because in the scheme they're running now, it's a lot more, you're playing a zone, you're playing a man, but you know your assignment and you're not necessarily as responsible for everybody else's. Um, and I think that makes it an easier job. So that's, I think, where there's a chance for Shannon Sullivan to be an improvement over Mackenzie Alexander at the nickel corner spot. That's what you're hanging your hat on, I think. That, look, I don't think he's a better player. He's certainly not more athletic or anything like that. Um, and he doesn't have the coverage ability. But the job's going to be easier. And so you don't need a better player. And, that's, and, and maybe, you know, if you're going to cheap out here, this is the cheap out option. And maybe that's okay in this particular scheme, and it opens up more to go get a premier corner or a guard or something like that. And we're going to talk about where that money could go, what the Vikings can do, because they have, we talked about it on Friday, a weird amount of cap space for the amount of stuff that they've done and the contracts that they have. They got like, I want to say like 14 million to play with, and some of that has to go to draft picks and stuff, but they still have like a decent chunk of change they can go out and play with. What do you do with it? Let me, however, talk to you first about Built Bar, it's the best tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bar is made of collagen protein mostly, but covered in 100% chocolate. It's not a lot of sugar in there, like four grams of sugar, maybe compare that to a candy bar that's got like 30 grams of sugar, but it tastes like a candy bar. They have super, super dialed in the flavors and stuff, so it tastes absolutely delicious. They've got all their main series flavors like uh, chocolate cherry, cookies and cream, uh, peanut butter brownie, chocolate orange if you're into that, that kind of thing. Or you can get their Built Puffs, which is like a marshmallowy one, and it tastes like a marshmallow chocolate covered candy bar, like something you would get at the checkout aisle at the grocery store. And like 130 calories in one of these bad boys, four grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein. So it's totally not going to knock you off the wagon, even if you have it late at night. Head on over to built.com, whatever you buy, enter promo code LOCKED15, that's L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, and you can get 15% off of your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 at built.com. 
So the Vikings, I guess we're going to say that they addressed a need. I'm a little dissatisfied with how they addressed it. I, I would like a better nickel corner, but I also understand the restrictions that they're working with here. And I think it's a good time to kind of step back and take stock. Where are we at right now? It's been a bit of a flurry. We, we're keeping Daniel Hunter. We got Zedaria Smith. That was a whole big thing. Anthony Barr, probably gone based on comments that Kevin O'Connell and, and Quasi Duffa Mensa have said. Um, and also some reports. I think Chris Thomason reported that he's like mulling retirement. So like there's probably not going to be an Anthony Barr return. Eric Hendricks, we thought maybe he was going to be traded. He's staying. Thielen, maybe he's going to be traded. He's staying. I was under the impression, and some of this was because of like some on the record information, off the record, public, not public, but I was under the impression that somebody was going to get traded. If they if they were going to extend Kirk Cousins, someone was going to get, you know, basically brought, was going to walk the plank over it um, and maybe get a draft pick back. The only cut that they had to do was Michael Pierce. And that seemed like it had as much to do with an interpersonal thing, a scheme fit thing. And, and Michael Pierce is like satisfaction with the organization as it did with money. I'm sure a pay cut, you know, offering a pay cut had something to do with that. But either way, the Vikings have kept their core intact better than I thought they were going to be able to. So I guess, you know, commend them for that. But here's where that leaves us. You got, I'm going to go with $6 million to spend. You got to keep a lot set aside for draft picks and uh, practice squad and contingencies and all that stuff. So we'll say they've got $6 million in actual spendable money that they can just throw at somebody right now and be totally fine. That's a decent chunk of change. Zadaria Smith, we went over it on Friday, costs $3.3 million this year. So you can get like a real free agent with that, maybe even a couple if you want to really backload the contracts like you did with Sedarius Smith. I don't know if they want to do that, but they could. And they can certainly like negotiate that way so they can be in on these markets. So what do we go for then? I guess it kind of makes sense to just talk about needs real quick. Uh, you know, you got you need a guard probably. You might want a center, but maybe they're okay with Bradbury. Um, they need uh, two outside corners unless you want to start one of Cameron Dantzler or Chris Boyd. You need a safety unless you want to start Cameron Bynum. Um, and th I guess that's where we put it, right? And you probably could use somebody else along the front or somebody rotational, maybe another rotational linebacker, and you can get into the depth needs and find a bunch more. Um, I, I wouldn't hate a wide receiver. I wouldn't hate a, uh, another receiving tight end, like a Tyler Conklin replacement. We kind of have our David Morgan replacement in Johnny Munt, like, which was a, a, a position that wasn't replaced for a couple of years. Now it is, but I, I would love a, a more receiving oriented tight end, tight end. So you could list all those off and say, there's the needs, go get them. And here's the, th the deal. You're not going to be able to solve all of those needs. So what's going to end up happening? And I genuinely don't think there's anything the Vikings can do about this. I also thought they would lose a player. I was wrong about that. So maybe I'm wrong here, but I think I'm going to stick to my guns. I don't think that they can do anything about this. They are going to have to trot out some bad players next year. They're going to have to try. They're going to just kind of have to like place some faith in Cam Bynum and hope that he takes a leap in his second year. And he played pretty well. There's a reasonable chance. Like there's a totally reason to believe that he will. But to rely on it is a much different question and they might not have a choice. I don't think they would do that if they really felt good about that. They might have to get some snaps out of a Troy Dye or a Chaz Surratt next year. They got Eric Kendricks. They got Jordan Hicks. But sometimes you want a little bit more speed on the field. So maybe somebody ha else has to take that moniker. But sometimes you want some speed on the field. They might have to start a Chris Boyd or a Cam Dantzler, even if you don't want to. I would love to make Cam Dantzler compete for a job, give him another Bashad Breeland to beat. And if he can't, then you're probably pretty glad he's not on the field, even though you don't necessarily like Bashad Breeland. It seems like Dantzler probably would have been worse if he was starting all year. You might need to put up, this one's going to really make the people mad, you might need to put up with another Ole Udo season or a Wyatt Davis, you know, hope Wyatt Davis makes the leap. And if he doesn't, you just kind of have a bad guard. Like you're, you're, you're going to have roster holes, at least headed into the draft. And even if you solve one of those roster holes with the draft, you got a first round rookie starting. I mean, Christian Derisaw wasn't ready until week seven. What do you do in the meantime? You're going to have to trot out your Rashad Hill for that position. And I guess that leads me into another part of the conversation, which is that can be okay. I mean, it's transition year, right? Like we're not looking at these guys like a Super Bowl team. I know the Vikings insist that they are. I'm not looking at it that way. And I'm willing to be patient through that. I'm willing to say, yeah, this is rough, but they're rebuilding a whole thing on the fly that's going to take one more off more than one off season, and I'm good to just like accept that. But where I think people lose me is when you start arguing for, well, go get a corner because we got to see what we have in Cam Bynum. That's where you lose me. And I guess I just want to talk about like whether it's a rookie this year or somebody like Wyatt Davis or Cam Bynum or name or whoever, Chaz Serac, Helen Munn, they need to earn that chance. If I ran an NFL team. I would not put every rookie out there just to see what I have in them. They'd have to earn it. 
that means beating a player, you know? Wyatt Davis can't be on the field until he beats Dakota Dozier out in a camp battle. I'm sorry. Look, you see him practice every day. I mean, Zimmer got in a whole bunch of trouble because they're like, hey, why didn't you start killing Mon? And he said, because I saw him in practice. That might have been a little brash, but it's also like, yeah, that's fair. What if he's awful in practice? How do you know he isn't? And I, I think where, I mean, everybody was mad at everything Mike Zimmer said, so you're not going to get reasonable responses to that. But I think we should probably take a step back from that now that we're a little removed from that whole situation with Davis, Mon, Surratt, whoever, that it is very easy to jump to the conclusion that Mike Zimmer hated all rookies, which he didn't. I mean, plenty of Pat Elfline started as a year one guy. If you're not better than Pat Elfline, you're not starting. I'm sorry. I don't care if you're a rookie. I don't care if I paid $10 million for you. If you're not better than Pat Elfline at your job, I'm not starting you. So I don't buy it that Zimmer like hated starting rookies. He didn't anoint rookies automatically with the job. He made them earn their job. And if they failed to do so, they wouldn't start. And if I were running a team, I would do it the same way. And I think Kevin O'Connell should, and maybe he will. The point is opportunities need to be earned. And so that's why I'm a little uncomfortable with just tossing Cam Bynum out there and saying, you are the starter. Two games, he played two reasonable games in relief for Harrison Smith when Smith was on the COVID list. That's not enough to earn the job. I need to give him some journeyman dude to beat. And then beat that guy in camp, and now you're the starter, and you won the job. But I got that that process needs to happen. And that kind of brings me to the draft. That guy can be a third-round pick, right? And you've got Cam Bynum and a third-round pick, and they're going to compete, and whoever you know wins the job wins the job. And now suddenly you've created an element of competition, the cream rises, and that's how you kind of find the diamonds in the rough. I am not interested in anointing a rookie with a starting position. So here's my challenge to you. When we get into October, November, there is going to be a rookie, unless they have the greatest draft class of all time, ever. There will be a rookie who is bad, who is not starting, and we don't know that he's bad yet. We just know that he's not starting. And I implore you, I beg of you, not to jump to the conclusion that there is some weird behind-the-scenes thing. Guys fail to transition to the NFL all the time. It's a super normal thing that just happens and you try to avoid it the best you can, but it is a very common outcome that we cannot dismiss just because we don't want to believe that the guy we were really excited about in the pre-draft might be bad. I want to transition into the draft though. Let's do a little mock draft Monday. I've got a very interesting situation for you. I'm excited to share it. Um, But first, let me talk to you about Something that I've been trying to do to improve my gut health. Gut health and gut bacteria is kind of a new sci- new-ish science as far as sciences go about a way to uh, control what's going on in your body and targeting that can give you more energy, better immune system, and you don't have to take a whole bunch of pills. Athletic Greens is like a powder you'd mix in a glass of water or something, and with one scoop, You are absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. Athletic Greens was created when the founder had a whole bunch of gut health issues and ended up with this like really complicated vitamin regimen that cost $100 a day to cover, to recover from what he was going through. And he created Athletic Greens after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutrition routine on your own. Right now, it is time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NFL Network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NFL Network to take ownership over your health and pick the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, are we ready to move on to mock Draft Monday. For those who are new to Mock Draft Mondays on the Locked On Vikings podcast, here's how it goes. I'm doing three rounds still for now. Um, I'm going to expand it to seven rounds soon, but for now we're doing three rounds. Um, Trades are available. I'm using the PFN Mock Draft Simulator, and I'll do trades, any trades. I'll check them against the chart to make sure I'm not doing something super broken. And I can't take anybody in that I've taken in a previous mock draft. So in this particular round of mock drafts, this is week two. Last week, I took Andrew Booth Jr., Jaquan Brisker, and Christian Watson out of... uh, NDSU. So I can't take those players again. No Andrew Booth, no Jaquan Brisker, no Christian Watson. This is to prevent me from taking the same picks over and over and over again in mock drafts. We're trying to get to know players. We're trying to familiarize ourselves with the board, talking about the same player over and over. Ain't going to do it. So 
That leads me to this mock draft. And what I was really trying to do was target Ahmad Gardner, Sauce Gardner from Cincinnati. I love him as a corner. Um, We didn't get him. He was available at pick number seven. I tried to trade up with the New York Giants, but I didn't want to give up a first rounder next year or my second rounder this year. So the next best asset, I think, is the second rounder next year. And that didn't get me up to seven. So um, I decided to try to get up to eight and maybe see if I could get away with using a third rounder for that. But the Giants at seven took him. So I missed out on him, but we're going to get him one of these days. So instead, from there, I let the board just kind of fall to me because there are a lot of players on the board that are uh, pretty exciting. I mean, there's Tyler Linderbaum if you're into undersized quick centers, but I mean, we kind of have one. So if you're into that, you know, I don't know about using a first rounder on a guy with a similar profile, but Jordan Davis, who if you're okay with a little bit of position redundancy, he's an absolute baller. Derek Stingley Jr. is on the board here. Um, The way the PFN board is constructed, it might be able to trade down a little bit and get him. There are some interesting wide receivers. There's Zion Johnson. So I am going to go with Derek Stingley Jr. out of LSU. He was early an early take in the last round of mock drafts. I'm going to do it again. I'm still taking a corner. We need one just so very bad. Um, and Derek Stingley is an interesting case. He might fall a little bit further than this. I might try to trade down. I don't think I'm going to this time. I'm just going to take him and don't mess with it. Um, and he is he's a press man corner. He totally fits what I want in this scheme. He's got the mentality that I want and all of that. I think the biggest thing, he's a little grabby sometimes, not a big deal to me. It's the kind of thing you can coach out. Um, but really health is the the deal with him. He's got a Liz Frank injury and he's middle of rehabbing for it right now. So he couldn't go at the NFL combine. And I think his draft stock has really taken a plunge. He is targeting his pro day. So we're going to see if he's healthy enough to run at his pro day. As of this recording, I don't know. LSU's pro day is at on April 6th. So we'll see if he can. And he's missed a lot of time with injuries. So you got to think about like a durability concern, but you have to put all of this in context. So Let's do that with Stingley. He had uh, in 2020, he missed a bunch of time with COVID. We don't expect that to repeat itself. He missed a bunch of time with COVID. There's not really anything about getting COVID once that makes you more likely to miss time with it again or anything like that, unless you have asthma or something. But I don't think Stingley has that. He had a nagging leg, leg injury and then this foot injury. So what you would have to look at is, are these two injuries related, right? Is that leg injury causing the foot injury? That means that there's a bigger problem. Something's getting stressed the wrong way, and that can be stressed again, and it can get hurt again. That's what I would be worried about. But if he's ready to go and he tests at his pro day, even if his numbers take a little bit of a hit, if he's at least healthy enough to run, it makes me feel pretty good that he's going to be healthy enough to play week one if we want him to. Um, And I would feel pretty good about taking him. And I think his ability at number 12, totally fine value with that. So we're taking Derek Stingley, but we are totally keeping an eye on that injury situation as it develops over the next couple weeks. Sitting here at pick number 46, I got a trade offer from the New England Patriots to trade back to pick 54, move back eight spots for a 2023 third rounder that about checks out on the trade charts. And I'm going to be honest, I'm pretty unfamiliar with the board here in the second round still. So all these guys kind of look the same to me, and I don't really have a guy that I'm like super bummed to miss out on. So I'm going to accept it. Uh, That obviously is not like that much thinking like an NFL team, but that's at least one way to think about it is if you have, if you're sitting there with nine players, you would like to take at this and and you have a trade offer to go back eight spots Go back eight spots and let the board make the decision for you. In fact, you're probably they're probably not going to run all of the same players. Somebody's going to take a team. Somebody's going to take a player you weren't even looking at. So I that's another reason I like trading down. You're still probably going to take a guy you were eyeballing in the first place. And as it so happens, that is absolutely happening here. Um, at fit pick 54, I was looking at a guard, Sean Ryhan, who I think fits what I really want to inject into the Vikings here, which is power, mean streak, get rid of these tiny little dudes, wide zone dudes. I want somebody that can do it. So let's look at Sean Ryhan, who is 6'4", 321, and let's see if he's actually a scheme fit. I'm going to take him for the excuse to talk about him, though, either way. And I I think he's one of those players that doesn't look like a scheme fit, but he is a scheme fit, not unlike Christian Derisaw, who didn't look like he's his own scheme fit, but he had decent zone traits. He's got the explosiveness. He's light on his feet, especially for his size, um, but he has that lateral athleticism. He can get that width. 
And then when he actually gets his big old paws on you, that's when the real good stuff comes out. So I feel pretty good about Sean Ryhan guard out of UCLA, taking him and slotting him right into that right guard spot. I should mention, he did play some tackle at UCLA and we're moving him inside to guard. That is a common thing that'll happen. And as long as we commit to that and we don't like pop him around the formation or anything, I feel a little bit more comfortable with that. Um, but I feel really good that we traded down, got that guy. He's going to have to do a little position switching. I'm not going to cry too many tears over it. You'd obviously prefer to have a a situation where you don't have to do that, but I'm committing here. I'm not going to have him try to learn both. I'm not going to be cheeky and bounce him around the formation a whole bunch. No, he's going to be the right guard. He's going to learn right guard and he's going to get there and we're going to be patient and let him. That brings me to pick number 77, where I am looking at a number of interesting skill players. I think I might still work on this secondary. We st- we still have um, a problem here. I-, I really, at the third round, I really want to give a little bit of competition to Cam Bynum. Um, and I love somebody who has a good, tr- quick trigger, a downhill threat, a run support type of safety, six foot, over 200 pounds, Um, Big hitter type, Leon O'Neal Jr. out of Texas A&M. And we're going to kind of round out the secondary that way. Hard hitter, really better in run support, really good at that insert into the B-gap job we talked a lot about. That's a big thing safeties have to do, and that makes him a little bit more compatible with Harrison Smith. So there's your mock draft. I took two D-backs again. I find myself being very drawn toward doing this. The board seems to support it, at least in this particular iteration. Um, You know, the opportunity is there, and of course the need is there. So I'm starting to get a sense that the Vikings might double dip on D-backs like I do, just because it seems to be something the board really, really wants you to do, and why would the Vikings resist that? Um, tomorrow is Twitter Tuesday, so get in your questions. I'm sure there will be a whole bunch of them. Um, make sure you check it out on YouTube. Check out the Locked On NFL podcast on YouTube. Also look at the Locked On NFL draft pod. We have so much cool draft stuff, y'all, at the Locked On Network. There's this, all the other shows, you know, go listen to Locked On Giants to see what they're thinking about at pick seven. You know, are they going to take Sauce Gardner? Do we have to trade up past them to get him? Or just listen to Locked On NFL Draft and watch Locked On NFL on YouTube. It is really cool stuff. I will see you all tomorrow. And as always, Skull.